Uh, good morning, Crossroads. How are you doing this morning? Good to see you. My name is Ed Applegate. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad uh, you joined us today. I hope you had a great Christmas. Uh, we had a great Christmas. We have five kids, ages 7 to 12, so there was no screaming. No, It was just totally peaceful, totally peaceful Christmas. We had a great Christmas. Uh, but we also had a great Christmas here at Crossroads. We had eight services, uh, and uh, hopefully you were able to come to one of those. Just a really great time making Jesus the center of the season. But what you might not know is we also did services for people who couldn't come here. We had four, we went to four nursing homes. We went to a prison. We went to a hospital. Uh, and we just brought Christmas there, which was totally Great, and uh, if you were a part of any of those services, the, the services here or, or around the region, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for being a part of that. Now, uh, now we stand three days away from 2020. 2020, can you believe that? Isn't that crazy? Aren't we supposed to be in like flying cars and have robot maids and, you know, is this supposed to be the Jetsons by now? I, I don't get it. But no, seriously, like, I was looking up things that people had predicted would happen by the year 2020. It's a pretty funny list. Like, uh, there was this guy, a surgeon named Richard Lucas, who in 1911, he predicted in a lecture to the, the Royal College of Surgeons that he said that by 2020, we would have one big toe. <laughs> one big toe? Like, where did you get that from? Uh, you know, the Wired magazine, pretty reputable magazine, they predicted by 2020 that humans would be living on Mars. Wow, that's kind of crazy. Well, we haven't even got close to that yet. Uh, my favorite, 1937, Nikola Tesla. He predicted that by 2020, nobody would be drinking tea and coffee. <laughs> yeah, it was a little off, like 500 billion cups of coffee last year off. Yeah, yeah. So. Obviously, those things did not happen. But looking back on 2019, man, there's some pretty cool things that happened in 2019. Who would have thought that there's a baby Yoda? Yeah? Where's he? Here he is. Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry for, like, true Star Wars fans, the child. We don't know if he's a baby Yoda, whatever he is. He's the child at this point. Uh, but, but this is probably one of the highlights of the year. Kanye West coming to Christ. Kanye, and Jesus is King being displayed in New York Times Square. Look at that, that giant, and it says Jesus is King on it. That's amazing. That's awesome. You know, something we often do, we, you know, and I do this as I get to the end of the year, I look to the coming year and I, I set goals. I think about, hey, how, what do I want to do next year? But sometimes what we don't do is we look back on the year that has passed and what we've learned, what we've discovered. You see, there's a phrase that I think we should take into 2020, and it's this, that hindsight is 2020. We say it all the time, but in three days, it takes on a whole new twist, right? Hindsight's all about what we wish we had known before we did something. You know, and maybe in your family, you have stories of hindsight. We have them in our family, like, you know, like the time my dad you know, took too early of an exit off of the freeway, so he decided, instead of like a normal person to go over, you know, onto the other side of the, and get back on the freeway, he decided to reverse down the off-ramp to get back on the freeway. <laughs> yes, and my dad was an awesome driver, and uh, those are kind of things he did all the time, and he got pulled over for it. <laughs> Hindsight is 2020. Or another story we talk about is when my granddad took the hot ashes from the fire, put them in the trash can outside the house, took the family out to church, came back, and his brand new custom home was ashes when they got back. Yeah, ouch. Hindsight is 2020. Hindsight is the opportunity for insight. We can learn from mistakes. We can gain awareness of missed opportunities. We can learn what worked and do more of that. But what if, what if hindsight wasn't just about us? What if hindsight was also about God? What if hindsight was also about relishing his faithfulness? You see, I think often what holds us back from going forward in our faith is that we forget what has gone behind us. You know, spiritually speaking, hindsight is a crucial tool. 
This morning we're going to look at a couple of different stories that are very similar, but where hindsight is a big difference in them. If you want to open your Bibles with me, you can open up to Exodus 14 and Joshua 3, and we'll be in those stories in just a moment. The first story in Exodus 13 is about or 14, I should say, the first story is is about about the people of Israel who are in slavery in Egypt. They've been in slavery for 400 years, uh, and they cry out to God, um, and God hears them, and he he calls up this guy called Moses to to, um, appeal to Pharaoh to let God's people go. So Moses goes up to Pharaoh, says, let my people go, and, and Pharaoh says, laughs in his face, basically says, God, who's God? Never heard of him. God's not pleased. God sends plagues upon the Egyptians. Each time Pharaoh says, if you take the plague away, I'll let your people go. Each time the plague goes away, Pharaoh changes his mind. And finally, the last plague is the loss of his firstborn son. And Pharaoh says at that point, all right, get out of here. I'm tired of you people. Get away. And the people get out of slavery. But not too long after the people get out of town... Pharaoh again, believe it or not, changes his mind and sends all his chariots after the people of Israel. And they come head to head at the Red Sea. The people are trapped. The giant Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. And they do all that they know how to do at this point and they panic. (laughs) But Exodus 14 picks up the story. Moses tells them, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. How many of you needed to hear that today? That the Lord is with you. He will battle for you. You don't know what 2020 holds. You don't know what you're going through right. I don't know what you're going through right now. But if you know Jesus, he is with you. And the Lord will be for you. Verse 15, then the Lord told Moses, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Wow, can that be amazing? Can you imagine walking? I mean, we, we're amazed when we go to like Monterey Bay Aquarium and we have like water around us, you know, and just looking up at all the different things. But this is a wall of water, nothing holding it back except God himself. Huge relief the people must have had and terrified at the same time at the power of God. But then it carries on, verse 23. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Wow. The people went from being terrified of the Egyptians to amazement at the power of God. And it says they put their trust in him. And you'd think that would be them good for life, right? That they'd never, ever doubt God again. That, like, that was it, like... They are good. God is powerful. God is faithful. No matter what we face, we are good. But you know what's coming, maybe. Just a few weeks later, they're camping at Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up the mountain to spend some time before God. And he's been up there 40 days. And they don't hear anything from him. The people start to kind of panic. They start to worry. They think he's died or something. And, And so after... They've been miraculously rescued by God, and they don't hear anything from Moses for 40 days. They do what any of us would do. They make a golden calf and worship it. Seriously, that is exactly what they did. This is where I've got to give it to Raiders fans. I mean, 
they put up with not 40 days of wondering, they put up with 36 years of wondering what's going on. And they're still faithful. I mean, amazing. But the Israelites, 40 days after seeing such miracles, and they're worshiping a golden calf. But before we judge the people of Israel, just think about us. Think about this last year. Think about your own trust in God. He's shown himself good. He's spoken to you. He's, you've given his, your life to him. But maybe you went through a test in your parenting, your marriage, your workplace, your health. And instead of trusting him and saying, God's got this, you took your own advice. You took your own course of action. Maybe you're not a believer yet, and that's awesome. I am so glad that you are here. But maybe you prayed and God answered a prayer, but you're still holding out on him. See, in small and large ways, the Israelite, just like the Israelites, we forget what God has done, and we don't look forward with the hindsight of God's faithfulness. After Moses had died, Joshua becomes the leader of the people of Israel. And once again, Israel finds themselves before a body of water. This time it's called the, the Jordan River. And in front of the Jordan, them and the Jordan River is the promised land, the land that God had promised to give the people of Israel. And there's enemies in that land. So now instead of the enemies being behind them, the enemies are in front of them. We pick up the story in Joshua 3. Verse 9, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come, hear, and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, these are all the enemies in the land that God has promised to, to them. Verse 13, As soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing down sea will, downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 15, as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great, in a heap, great, a great distance away so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. That's incredible. Once again, just like the Red Sea, but this time God wants them to remember better. So he gives them additional instructions. Joshua 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Jump down to verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. See, this time the Lord said, when you are facing the enemies in front of you, I want you to remember what I did. I want you to look back. There's no forgetting like you did with Moses. So they picked up souvenir stones from the middle of the Jordan, Stones far bigger than this one. Stones that men had to carry on their shoulders. And they made a pile as a memorial to what God had done. Stones that would sit there for generations to come. To, stones that would cry out, God is faithful. God is powerful. God can be trusted with your whole entire life. So here's my question for you this morning. What are you carrying into 2020 to remind you that God is faithful? What are you carrying into 2020 to remind you that God is powerful, that he can be trusted with your whole entire life? It doesn't have to be stones. It could be stories. It could be something you've written down. It could be some kind of other souvenir. But what are you carrying to remind you 
to give you hindsight. One of the stories I'm carrying into 2019 has to do with stones. Uh, this past year in October, the pastors and directors, we were able to get away for a day for some time of silence and solitude to Yosemite National Park. You know, these are where some of the largest stones in the world are, but El Capitan and Half Dome, just beauty, beautiful. You know, uh, the kids and I just watched uh, Free Solo, uh, that movie about Alex Hanold who climbed up El Capitan with no ropes. I mean, I was sitting there sweating in my couch, on the couch. I can't imagine what that was like for that guy. But that's incredible. But here's the thing. God created those stones. And he holds those stones in his hand like I'm holding this one. And as I sat there that day, it was like God was saying to me, Ed, I know you've got a lot on your plate. I know there's a lot ahead of you, but I am with you. I am faithful. Trust me. I'm your rock. Psalm 18 says this, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So I carry into 2020 the memory of that day sitting before those rocks knowing that God is my rock that he is faithful, and he holds El Cap in his hand. See, just like those stones from the Jordan, that generation of Israelites could look at, we have to tell stories, we have to have stories that give us the hindsight of God's faithfulness. Let me give you three reasons why. Here's why. First of all, hindsight steadies us in crisis. Hindsight steadies us in crisis. See, what often happens when crisis hit is that we lose it, we flounder, we feel like the sky is falling. You know, maybe it's a diagnosis we receive, a boyfriend breaks up with us, we lose our job, we lose a loved one. It's hard to stay steady in a crisis. But that's where hindsight can help us. You know, I was reading recently about <coughs> boats and how they stay uh, or ships, maybe even, how they stay steady in the midst of even hurricanes and storms. And what I was reading, it was, tell, it was saying that the worst ship, the worst ship to be on in the midst of a hurricane is an empty one. Because it's the weight of the ship, the ballast, if you like, in the bottom of the boat that helps it against the waves, that helps it stay steady. See, being... A follower of God with no stories of his faithfulness is dangerous. The hindsight of his power and his faithfulness is the weight that keeps us steady in the storms of life. You know, the people of Israel could look at those rocks from the Jordan River and say, God is powerful. God is faithful. He's brought us this far. Why would he leave us now? We just finished a series looking at uh, Christmas through the eyes of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it was an awesome series, and we learned so much about the Christmas stories. We looked through our eyes. But I love what Luke tells us in chapter 2 of his gospel, right after explaining all these different stories that Mary had lived through. It says this in 2.19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She treasured these stories. See, we have baby books for our kids. Um, you probably did too, you know, filled with photos and hospital bands, special memories, first diapers, all those kind of things. No, not the first diapers. Uh, <laughs> you all thought I was serious there for a second, huh? But Mary's baby book for Jesus was full of stories of angels and dreams and a special star in the sky and shepherds and wise men and prophecies fulfilled. She treasured those stories, and it's those stories that would have kept her steady when she was facing all the trials of the judgment of others, and not to mention what Jesus, she was going to watch Jesus go through, ultimately giving up his life on the cross. See, it's stories of God's faithfulness, it's hindsight that keeps us steady in crisis. We're not to be empty ships in the midst of a storm. Secondly, hindsight gives us confidence. Hindsight gives us confidence. You might even say this, hindsight gives us 
Godfidence. Godfidence. I thought I was being clever there, making up a word, you know, but then I searched it on Google and it's like a billion hits. Nothing, <laughs> nothing new under the sun. But here's how I define it. Godfidence. The present confidence through remembering God's past faithfulness. Present confidence. It's all about being proactive. Expecting God is going to be with us and help us as we live according to his will. A story that I love that's, that illustrates this is where David was going before Goliath. You know, there was no soldier in Israel who was willing to go up against Goliath. And then David, this kid, comes along and says, hey, I'll take him on. He goes before King Saul. And King Saul's like, you're crazy, dude. Why are you even thinking that you could go up against Goliath? And David says this, it's recorded in 1 Samuel 17. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and kill it. killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. That is Godfidence. That is going active into the battle, knowing what has gone behind. God rescued me from the past. He will certainly be with me in the future. Here's what I wonder. What 2020 is going to look like for you? what God's going to call you to do. But I know there are things that he's calling you to do because I know he calls all of us to these things. He wants us to reach our families, to reach our neighbors, to reach our work colleagues. He wants us to live a life of integrity, to live a life of generosity. Where do we get the confidence to live a life like that? To go into those things and say, this is what I'm going to do. We look back and we see how he has been faithful and now we look forward and say, I can do this because God is with me. You see, we don't know maybe where 2020 will take us, but I love what Corey Ten Boone said. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You see, with hindsight, we can have Godfidence. Finally, hindsight impacts the generations. When God told the Israelites to carry those stones, he said it wasn't just for them, right? Remember what Joshua told the people. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel for. Ever. They were to pass down from generation to generation the story of God's faithfulness. And we're to do the same, to pass down to children, our children's children, the stories of God's faithfulness. One of the stories that we share in our family uh, is the story of how my mom and dad moved us here from England uh, when I was four years old. You might not know that, I'm British, and uh, uh, we, I was born in a town called Dorchester in England, and when I was four, my dad received a call to go into ministry. He was a teacher at the time, and, and uh, he knew God was calling him into ministry, and I don't know why, I never got a chance to ask him, but, why did, but, but he felt God was calling him to come to Modesto, California to train to become a pastor. I don't, I don't know, but he knew that that was where God was calling him to. And so the decision had been made, and they, my mom and dad were starting to prepare uh, to move here. We, we, uh, we were a family of six. My mom and dad have four boys, which is amazing. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we, as we were getting ready to move, unbeknownst to the rest of us, my dad was really just kind of feeling nervous about this. He was like, this is a big move. We'd, they'd never, like, hardly been out of the country, let alone moved the family to a whole other country. And as my, my mom wrote, she, she wrote this down for me, uh, dad was praying about specifically about three areas. 
Firstly, he was praying about our finances, as we'd only have a very small income when we moved here. He was praying about um, his son's education, our education, because he was worried that the schools here uh, would be as good as the education in England, which he found out they were. But uh, what his, And then he was, thirdly, he was praying about what his ministry would be after training. He just didn't know. He knew God was calling him into ministry, but he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. So my mom writes, Dad and I had heard of this church that was about a half an hour drive away from where we were living and had been curious about going there. So one Sunday afternoon, before we moved here, we felt we should go there. This involved getting a babysitter for four young boys. We phoned, and she happened to be available. And it also involved making sure someone was available to cover Dad's work, which, was, which all worked out. It all came together, and we set off. We were late arriving to the church as we had difficulty finding it, so we did not talk to anyone before the service as it had started before we got there. We sang a few songs, and the visiting preacher was introduced. He started by saying, before I preach, I would like to ask, is there a man from Dorchester here tonight? We lived, you know, we, I was born in Dorchester. Dad thought there must be somebody else here from Dorchester um, besides him. So he didn't raise his hand, but he soon realized he was the man. The preacher then said, as I was driving down here from London yesterday, the Lord gave me a message for a man who would be here tonight from Dorchester. The message was this, I have heard your prayers and I have answered them. That was the, yeah, wow, huh? Yeah. My mom writes, this was the confirmation to dad that God was with us in this faith venture, which God was calling us to as a family. After the sermon, the church gathered around dad and I and prayed for us, sending us out. That's a story for the books. And that's a story to pass down generation to generation. But it's not just stories of, from our own family that we can pass down. It's story, other stories, stories from other Christians who have also uh, struggled and seen God been faithful. I love reading biographies. Even this Christmas, we, we, had our ki- we always have our kids get a gift from each other. Usually it's a book. And, and so this year, we, we kind of directed them to all these different Christian biographies of stories of Christians who, who have seen God do amazing things because we want our kids to have the hindsight that God is faithful, that God is powerful, And no matter what they face, he can be trusted. You know, one day, when those who have followed Jesus uh, get to heaven, I think there's one, we're going to be overwhelmed by a lot of things, but one of the things we're going to be overwhelmed by is we're going to have this kind of heavenly hindsight. And we're going to see, almost in an instant, how secure we were in God's hands. We're going to look back on our lives and go, my goodness, I could have risked so much more. My goodness, I could have been on mission so much more. My goodness, I could have worried so much less because I was so secure in him. We'll have this heavenly hindsight. But let's not just wait for that. huh? Let's give the heavenly hindsight now. Let's have the insight that comes from that hindsight. Let's go into crisis with steadiness because we know God is faithful. Let's go into our mission that he's calling us to because we know he is powerful. Let's pass on from generation to generation stories of how he has been shown himself to be faithful and true. Let's be people whose hindsight is 2020, and so we walk powerfully into the new year. Would you pray with me? Father, as we, uh, just in three days, start a, a brand new decade, uh, Lord, we don't know what we will face. Uh, maybe right now we're facing troubles that are just overwhelming, uh, And some of us are going to face troubles that are overwhelming as we walk into a new year. Lord, I just pray that in those moments, by your spirit, you would remind us of your faithfulness. 
You would remind us of your power. You would remind us uh, that you can be trusted with all our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would be steady in the midst of crisis. I pray that we would be on mission with confidence because we know you are with us because you have shown yourself faithful in the past. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that passes down from generation to generation to generation, that you are good, that you are powerful, that you are faithful. Lord, may we not, not forget, but may we have hindsight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've discovered Jesus and this ministry has helped you follow him fully, join us in reaching others by partnering with us today. You can give through our Crossroads app or at crossroadsgrace.org slash give. Thank you for listening and remember to subscribe to enjoy more messages like this. Now go and follow him fully.